Hi, this is Randy Randall of No Age and host of the podcast Hyphen It with Randy Randall. I want to welcome our newest sponsor of the show, DistroKid. DistroKid helps musicians get their music on all the major streaming platforms and artists keep 100% of their royalties. Hyphenate listeners get 30% off at distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash hyphenate. Again, that's distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash H-Y-P-H-E-N-A-T-E. Go get your music streaming everywhere now. I like loud amps, and I'm actually quite lucky. When I'm testing an amp, nobody tells me to turn down. Yo! Welcome to Hyphenate with me, Randy Randall. This is our episode for Thursday, March 21st, and uh, today I'm very honored and very happy to welcome my guest, Miss Colleen Fazio. She is an incredible um, amp repair person and all around um, jack of all trades, all things amps, specifically um, older tube amps, you know, vintage, I think is what they like to be called. They're not older, they're vintage. One, uh, you know, description we should also be so lucky to get applied to us as we age in this world. But she, she works on vintage tube amps. She's amazing. She has an um, awesome YouTube channel. She has a great website, fazioelectric.com. You can get your very own crew neck sweatshirt like I have. You can see pictures of it on my Instagram, at Randy S. Randall, there on the Instagram. You can also follow Colleen on Instagram, at Fazio Electric. That's F-A-Z-I-O-E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C. Fazio Electric. Um, she's incredible. She's really cool. I really appreciate her uh, coming over to the house. This is one of the um, rare in-person interviews I get to do these days. She uh, lives in the neighborhood. We are tucked up in the foothills of uh, Southern California, just above Los Angeles and Burbank and Glendale. And it's cool. She found her way up into this um, cool little weird corner of that land, you know, the land that time forgot. And that's how I always kind of refer to where we're at here. It's a funny little spot and it's perfect for Colleen and her incredible, um, and prepare. And she's got a great story. So, uh, yeah, really happy to present that interview with you. Thank you for, uh, everyone for all the great, um, responses and feedback to last week's uh, Kyle McLaughlin interview. That really took me by surprise that was really fun i'm really really happy how how much everybody enjoyed it and um just so much love for kyle i mean gosh the guy you know is a legend in his own time and um and is so loved you know everybody every every message was like what this is incredible kyle we love him he's the best you know people that didn't you know just came out of the woodwork to just give give good props to kyle and his work and in our interview so i was really really happy with how, how that all came together um but yeah, we have great stuff. I'm really excited. Everybody's enjoying Hyphenate. Um, you know, started it last summer. Not really sure how it was all working. Kind of putting it together with uh, tin foil and bubble gum and sweat and blood and tr- trying to figure out <laughs> every bump as it goes. But if you like the show and if you're digging, if you're enjoying it, and you um, think you have any friends, family, neighbors, soccer coaches, you know, badminton. Um, you know, racket restringers, anybody you can think of that you would think it would enjoy the show, please recommend it to them. I think that's really how podcasts uh, get passed around. It's still word of mouth. It's one person telling another person and all of this newfangled digital wizardry and distribution. One person saying, Hey, I heard this good podcast. Check it out. You would like it and just tell them what it's called. And, and I think that's really how, you know, podcasts uh, get found out about. Uh, and if you really, really like it, um, go ahead, leave a review on um, Apple podcasts. I don't know if Spotify, you can leave a review, but if you can, I think you can. I think I've left a review there. I think the only review up for the show is reviews I left when I first started the show. I'm like, I'm going to just kick things off here. I'm going to go ahead and review the show, say it's really great. And I really like the host. Um, so please join me there. <laughs> or you can at least go there to read my own dumb review I left for the podcast when it first started. And, uh, yeah, any any feedback is always good feedback. Yeah, find me on Instagram, like I said, at Randy S. Randall. Um, please go follow Colleen Fazio. And if you were in the Southern California area and you need to get your amps uh, worked on, I know she's backlogged because she's you know very popular and very busy, but she's incredible. It's worth it if you can wait. Um, you know, jump on the waiting list there, and also find her and follow her on her YouTube channel. I should find out what that YouTube channel is called. Uh, it is also called Fazio Electric. 
she's got 72,000 followers there. So jump on that. You can, uh, you know, follow her as she gets into the guts of all these old, amazing, cool vintage amps. And she's pretty rad. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the one and only Miss Colleen Fazio. Colleen Fazio, thank you so much for uh, joining me here on the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here in your awesome studio. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, you're one of the few in person. I've been doing a lot of these online, so thanks for for making the trek over to uh, to the The long 10-minute trek. (laughs) Yes, yeah. (laughs) Um, So tell me a little bit about yourself. You're on the show as a hyphenate, as a a guitar player and amp repair. That's probably what people know you the most Mm. as, but you're also a wicked pool player, which we can touch on as well. Yes. But um, but tell me, yeah, when did you first start playing guitar? I started playing guitar when I was about seven or eight years old. Um, my uncle had, a, he's always had guitars and music stuff around, and I would just kind of like gravitate towards the guitar. And I picked it up, and he's like, huh, seems like she's interested in guitar. So he bought me one for Christmas. It was like a little kid's acoustic guitar. And I started taking, my mom signed me up for lessons Um, doing classical guitar, which was cool because I learned how to read music at that time and just kind of, I didn't really, you know, as a kid, I didn't really care what I was learning. Just the fact that I was learning guitar was cool to me. So that's how I started. And I've played on and off for, you know, since then I switched to bass for a while in like middle school and high school bands and beyond. But the last few years I've focused on guitar again. So amazing and mm-hmm. and that's so cool yeah to, to be able to learn music like to read music at that age like, mm-hmm. that's such a crucial skill right i think most guitar, like i never learned yeah you know, i mean like, now i don't really use that those skills <laughs> anymore but when i was in jazz band in middle school and high school it came in handy because i would read you know it's all sheet music for the most part and then i switched to bass during that time because we needed a bass player in jazz band and bass is a little bit more crucial than guitar in jazz band so uh, my teacher wanted me to switch, and I was able to learn pretty quickly. That's amazing. That's so cool. And what were some of your early instruments? You said, you know, like you know, classical sort of guitars. but Classical, with, with... yeah. So I, you know, I learned, like, finger-picking right off the bat with classical guitar. Um, and then my first electric guitar was a Fender Duo Sonic. Do you remember um, what year? Like, I don't know what year. Like contemporary production stuff that was coming out. Yes, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. It was like a cool, cool, like, cream color. It's still at my parents' house. Those are great guitars. Yeah. And they're in the good size, too. It's not really a full... Is it, is it's there, like a shorter scale. It, it's not a full three-quarter, but it's, it's kind of just on the more smaller side. Yeah, yeah, so it was perfect for me as like a kid to be able to play it. Um, and then my first bass, which is actually the bass I've used my whole life, is a... Um, Tele P bass reissue. Um, I've that thing is beat up. I've <laughs> played that in jazz band on tour. I've lent it out to friends who are on tour. So that bass has been through a lot, but it's still my primary bass. That's awesome. Yeah. And then um, I want to keep talking guitar stuff, but I'm so curious about the amp repair. That's really mm-hmm. you know where I think you've sort of built a name on social media and through the YouTube channels and stuff. Like, tell me what where did the amp repair come in, or what was your first amp, and then we'll kind of get into that. So yeah. it's so funny. Yeah. My first amp, I don't remember what it was. I just remember it was a small tweed style amp. Whether it was my uncle lent it to me, so my uncle <coughs> he'll come into play with the um, amp stuff, but he's always had a great collection of gear, and he would kind of lend things to me, awesome. so I could try things out. But as a kid, the amp was I it would was either a Champ or maybe like a small tweed like Gibson, Clone or something. yeah, something. Yeah. But I just remember it being old. Yeah. So. <laughs> Before I even knew what a tube amp was, I was enjoying one. So, yeah, that was like my first, the first amp that I probably used with the Duo Sonic. But um, that uncle, he and my other uncle, together, they built guitar amps. So all through my life, you know, I had seen them producing these gorgeous amps because one of my uncles is a carpenter, so he would build the cabinets and they're beautiful, like, furniture 
pieces. And then my other uncle, he was a musician and he kind of like designed the circuit board and was going after the certain sound. So that's how I knew it was a thing. That is super pursue. cool. What what was the name of their amp company? What were they uh, called? They're called Vero. V E R O. Okay. Are they and still around today? They're still around. They're not really producing amps anymore. They were, I think, the '90s and early 2000s was like their. That was the sweet spot. The sweet spot for them. Okay. I think they've taken the amps to Nam at some point, but they're gorgeous. I mean, I've never seen anything like them. And just like the craftsmanship behind the cabinets and the look and sound to them inspired me to be like, huh, this is a cool thing that I would love to learn more about. Yeah. And having it in the family there is mm-hmm. a cool way to look at it. What, just from a guitar nerd standpoint, those are all nerd out if you yeah, don't know. No, we'll totally. take a nerd tangent if we can. What, what was it? There, was it like a Marshall style thing? Or it, what was was it? More, what was more, it was very unique. Okay. I would say like it. Each amp was super different, too, and I think the entirety of them producing amps, they were all kind of different, like they were evolving, Um, but the ones I've seen, they use like EL84 output tubes, Um, some of them use 6V6s, I would say sound-wise, somewhere between a Fender but a little more souped up. Um, a lot of blues players like them. And my uncle loves to play like blues, western swing, that kind of stuff. So it's that type of sound to cater towards. That's so cool. That type of music, yeah. I, um, my first real amp um, is hiding back here somewhere. You might see the brown... I don't know if it's behind there. It was a, um, a Marshall Club and Country. Oh, yeah. Which was so fun, which is kind of in that same sort of style. But it's, a, you know, the, I think it's a 410. It was really, but it's so cool. It was really top heavy, though. It was, it was falling over all the time. Oh, my like, gosh. I got it from a friend who got it from, like, a, you know, somebody who was uh, addiction compromised. You know, mm-hmm. and, and so he was selling it for cheap, and my buddy got it. And then uh, and then he sold it to me for cheap. And it was just this, it was so loud. It just <laughs> broke up and, like, literally would fall over, like, every. Oh my practice. gosh! I'm like, yeah. I feel like, I mean, were you a kid when you got that? Yeah, for like 14, yeah. 15. Yeah, as I a did kid, not appreciate how, what it is. Like now, I like baby it. Like never goes anywhere. Right. <laughs> but again, like we talked about, like just throwing it into the back of cars to go exactly. play games. Exactly. You don't and care. Stuff. You're like, just like whatever. Yep. But yeah. yeah, as a kid, like you just want that loud Marshall sound. Yeah, for but there, and there's sure. something about you know, especially like you know, not knowing what you have, but just you know, like this sound, like being a being a learner or beginner at a guitar and having a great tube amp is really just like a, a embarrassment of riches. You, it, right, and you it, get because spoiled. at the time, like I obviously had no, I still I don't know. I should find out what that amp was. It was a very short period of time that I had it, but just like yeah, you don't realize what it is half the time no, until you start you know your music journey evolves and you're like oh these are tools and i should learn more about these tools that i'm using yeah but again but i think that's part of what you fall in love with is just the i do this it, the the tools do this i you know mm. I, I scream into this thing i play this thing hard and it sounds loud and there's just that tactile kind of like body molecular sort of like thing if you if you you know if you get the bug for loud electric oh, guitar yes. those are those kind of moments you're like i don't know what this is like i'm gonna go ahead and just say it's magic yes i'm also you know it is magic yeah, yeah two years ago i was also playing with like toys and ninja turtles and baseball cards and now i'm like have the shredding screaming the guitar garage. you know what i mean so like <laughs> magic is real like your whole body is changing your whole life yeah. is changing and now you have this loud guitar just in your hands and in, in your room and you're it's just like so true the world it's such is a powerful <laughs> experience as a kid like to have, uh, to play a loud guitar yeah and if you can't especially if you can't really play that well like right. <laughs> you can make for it up or make up for it with volume yes. like let's, i don't Turn know what gain really yeah, high. that one note just sustaining forever is like it's so much better than trying to play 10 notes just like let's play really slow and just turn it up yeah <laughs> um so so having the uncles producing amps around you that would you go in and, and help them or what was your first sort when did you first sort of like get into the guts of the of the amp and yeah. sort of start to like mess around um so after high school i didn't really know like what i wanted to do so I moved with my band to, I'm from Illinois, the okay. suburbs of Illinois. So my band and I moved to Chicago. What was your band called? Um, at the time we were called the Brass Kicks. Um, but yeah, we were like bluesy rock, psych rock kind of. But so we moved to Chicago and I was, you know, playing music and working odd jobs and everything. And one day I just, for some reason was like, you know, I, w- I really would love to learn how to build an amp or to 
learn more about amps. So on the weekends, I would go back to Plainfield, where I'm from, and hang out with my uncle. We'd listen to like Western Swing, and he would kind of teach me how to build one of his amps. So I learned like literally how to use wire strippers and how to wire something up and what different components were. It was really like my introduction to everything, my first hands-on experience. So I caught the bug then for that, and I took a class in Chicago at the Chicago School of Guitar Making at the time. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do guitar work or amp work, so I was exposed to both of them, those things in those classes, and they're like little weekend seminars, and... I built like a tweed deluxe clone in one of the classes and I was like, yeah, I I like this. And then they opened up. I don't, it was probably like a sixties deluxe reverb or something that they opened up and showed us and just the old electronics. I was like, whoa, because I've always been drawn to like old things. So yeah, that's really where it began. And like since then, I mean, it's been crazy just learning more and more all the time about it, but I also worked um, in Chicago. I would say like my first like mentor, uh, Mike Del Valley. He has a audio repair shop um, in Woodridge, Illinois, and they do like record players, amps, keyboards, anything audio. Um, But he specialized in the vintage stuff, and other techs there would do some of the more modern stuff. But he kind of took me under his wing and taught me all about fixing things and how to diagnose and test. So. A I've of, had a lot, lot of chopsticks, of, yes, touching things. Yeah. Yes, chopsticks, <laughs> safety things, yeah. what to do, what not to do. I learned a lot, but he was so patient with me. And um, yeah, so he gave me a lot of confidence and further helped me develop the love for vintage equipment. Um, so I, I'm lucky to have had a lot of great guidance from all different areas in everything to do with amps and vintage audio. That's so cool. I mean, it really is like something that like, you know, I think everybody that plays them, you know, it's either like, Oh, I want to, I want this thing. Oh, but it's, it might be broken. So you kind of right. like that stay away from it or there, or you find, find you take it to a place and you're like, Oh, I just spent as much to fix it as I spent on the amp. Right? Right. That's sort of the story of vintage gear, especially totally. when you're younger. And I remember at least my story, you know, when I was in my twenties, it's like, I like this thing. I, I bought it for, you know, 300 bucks and now the guy wants 500 bucks to fix it right and like i don't know what's it or same with car you know i mean it's a lot of that kind of stuff a lot of it goes hand in hand it's funny because a lot of my mentors who do amp repair also work on their cars for fun or whatever (laughs) so it's stuff that goes hand in hand for sure but yeah with and that's something i learned with pricing and how much it really costs because when i worked at deltronics um that audio repair shop I was also doing like secretary stuff and office manager stuff. So I would take everything in and call people with estimates. So that also kind of gave me the business side experience where I was able to be like, okay, what's a fair cost for this type of repair or whatever. But with vintage stuff, I feel like, especially now, even there's like such a resurgence of people who want to use tube amps or analog equipment and it is costly to fix it, but for a lot of people, it's worth it, you know? It's part of the investment in these exactly. vintage pieces is having it up and running and especially seen by a good tech. And I just know from my own experience, like having a good tech is like everything, you yes. know? And it's hard because people move and things go, you right. know what I mean? Like um, uh, Andy, you mm-hmm. know, who we talked about earlier with his revamp amps was was such a was such a godsend in LA, you know, for just fixing great stuff. And, yeah. and it's funny though, too, I think a lot about, um, you know, the... Tube amps, it's funny. I always, I always do kind of equate them to cars, like especially old vintage cars mm-hmm. where it's just a big the big engine. You can get in there. There's plenty of room. You can stand in it. Totally. Stand there next to it. You can Literally. just get in there. You know, stick your hand all the way in. And then newer, you know, um, solid state, but even old solid state stuff still has a lot of room. But mm-hmm. newer, th- you know, like everything, just the way of the, the, the you know. It's compact. It's really. Yeah. Yeah. I really think there's l- similar, like the old car thing the similarity is like with vintage gear it's serviceable like even you like back in the day you could take tubes to a drugstore and use the tube oh, tester yes. I've for seen your TVs those. or whatever yeah. um, so there is like such a tactile experience with vintage stuff and just the way it sounds and the way it works it's just 
very right there in front of you. There's really no hidden bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see exactly what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. But again, but it seems like there's, there's the people that'll work on those. Mm -hmm. And it's usually there's a tube. Okay. I have a tube tech and then I have a solid state tech. Right. And you know, maybe the solid state guy will look at the tubes, but the tube guy will definitely not want to see the solid state stuff. Like where do you fall in that spectrum of old, new, obviously the old stuff is sort of where it's at, but yeah, I would say the old tube stuff, like anywhere between like the thirties and the mid Mm eighties is kind of my specialty. I've in the past like we'll do like rolling jazz chorus amps if they just need service. A lot of the older solid state stuff just needs like cleaning and resoldering. But I will do a case by case basis. Like sometimes I'll do old like solid state sun or acoustic amps just for fun. <laughs> but I don't really do any modern solid state. Um I do modern like Fender reissue amps and Blues Juniors, Hot Rod, Deluxes and everything. Because those are sort of following a, the, an older sort of right. pattern. And yeah. there, it, there are some solid state circuitry in those amps, but it's it's simple enough for I can understand yeah. it. And, and it's, it's, it's Mike sort of understanding like some of the newer stuff. It's like it's 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 almost like taking a computer part or something. It's like mm-hmm. there's it's digital and it's chips and it's circuit boards and it's sort of like. Well, it could be a lot of the programming could be wrong. You could right. just be out of sync with could whatever. Could just need a software update or right? something. Yeah, your firmware is, is expired. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, I don't really know what that means to me. I don't have It's crazy because uh, at Deltronics, yeah. we have a tech there who does like a lot of the DJ equipment and uh-huh. the newer oh, God, keyboards. Yeah. And like with the DJ equipment, it's literally most most of the time just needs a firmware update. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm so bad with computers. So I, my brain just doesn't really understand digital technology like just how it works i just understand that analog tube circuitry way more yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah well it's funny yeah, i've looked at this I, I i fell in love with this early 80s there's one peeking out there i think it's taken apart this early 80s roland um little practice amps mm-hmm. and their jfet chips which i've kind of mm-hmm. learned you know i feel like i've i've just back into just from having i feel like it was the same way with cars like just having a lot of broken stuff and being broke mm-hmm. being broken having broken equipment like turns you into a, a bit of a a scientist. DIY. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, not, you're not necessarily good at it, but you you learn the parts, the important parts that you need to know to just to know when. Like, do I know enough about this? Yeah. And I, I found a schematic for it on on eBay for like ten bucks, and for that, and because I just loved how it sounded, mm-hmm. and I and I figured it out. But it's um, but it's almost more akin to like a um uh early like graphing calculator or early calculators. Yes. Yeah. It's probably the closest equivalent of the electronic technology <laughs> involved in that amp. It's right. like The chip sets and the things are there, and so it's like. You know, you might as well be taking, you know, like, like, hey, can you fix my calculator mm-hmm. to like a vintage, you know, to like yeah. you want you want to get your this we we rebuild, you know, '60s Mustangs. Like, yeah, but what about this '80s calculator? Like, yeah, yeah I don't know what to tell you about. <laughs> like, there's no there's no gas that goes in there. Right. I can't tell you what to do. Like, it's, it's cool though, like what you were just saying about how like you know if you have broken stuff and you want to learn how to fix it, that's the way to learn hands on. Just like try and figure out, oh, how does this work? Yeah. I mean, and is that part of, you know, with, so as, as you, as you do the work now yourself and you make, and you're making content and you're making videos, is that part of your sort of like mission to sort of help talk about it or demystify it? Or how do you, how do you sort of approach that or what sort of brought you to that sort of side of things? Like on the public, more public facing yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, regarding like the YouTube <clears throat> channel, I, that started because I, a little bit of like, you know, just talking about things and informing people about, you know, how if you do want if you do decide to work on your amp with high that has high voltage like a tube amp this is how to be safe with it um and then it kind of evolved into archiving repairs that were really special like i've done um videos showcasing amps that i'll probably never see again especially in such good condition what were some of those what are some of the highlights of that sort of um i have the 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 main one, I think it was a 1939 Gibson um, amp, I believe EH 185 or 135, Um, but it was in like it was in somebody's closet for the last wow almost century. I don't even know what that model is. What does that look like? Like what is that? They look like kind of a Tweety material a little bit, but it looks like an old suitcase. 
like maybe whatever they used to wrap the cabinet was like some sort of material that they would use for suitcases or something. But it just has such a cool look to it and a very um, like the tubes were all original too. They had like the big like military spec tubes in it. So cool. So that was like a time. It's like a time capsule. So I like archiving that type of thing or just amps that I'm drawn to or are feel inspired to show. But it's turn. It's definitely turned into like an archiving thing. That's so cool. Yeah, just like stuff stuff that comes on across oh, mm-hmm. your bench. Like wow, everybody, yeah, let's look at like, this. Like sort of call out the special ones. Like yeah. you don't see this every day. I've done a few. Mm-hmm. Like I think I've done a champ and a twin video, which are super common amps. Yeah. Which is cool because a lot of people have them, and so like, oh, I want to see, you know, how somebody would repair one of these. But then there's like the rare amps, like that Gibson, or I've done like some Silvertone stuff. I just did a PV one, so just it's fun. That's cool. Is that the the Roadmaster? Yeah. Oh yeah, I saw that one on there. It's so fun. I had a Concert Master years ago. It was Mm. such a behemoth. They're I had, huge. I had that and a V and a Ampeg V4B that I would use, and it just really, really became like a, a muscle show to mm. just, yes. just, just to take them around. It's like For okay, real. I can't do this, and especially if you're trying to put a stack together or something. Like, like I'm not lift uh, it. getting that thing over your head. I mean, it's over, you know, fifty going into that sixty, maybe even more. I don't know. It just felt like gnarly, and it was just one of those moments. I'm like, okay, this is this is really getting to be. It's totally uh, a different like job. the era, like '70s into the early '80s, where loud huge stacks heavy stacks was yeah. like the cool thing yeah and it's still cool but <laughs> practical not all the time <laughs> yeah yeah well i think a lot of it so much has to probably just go through just the development of the modern pa as well mm-hmm. i mean the story of of amps especially vintage amps goes hand in hand with just basic modern stagecraft or these types of things acoustics and, totally you know you think about a lot of that stuff just we're you know like woodstock or something we're just, we're just in a field or in a place you know yes. and like line arrays and different you know things that didn't really exist or even like clean power and things I know, you know like really sometimes i think time. about like woodstock and like how did it sound to be in the <laughs> crowd there like what did like because we've yeah. all heard like recordings and stuff from woodstock but just like yeah man i don't know yeah i love i love do you, do you follow dave rat he does rat sound. He came from like the Black Flag world okay. and then sort of developed, you know, sort of the modern festival sort of line mm. arrays and things. And he has a great channel. Um, he just talks, he just, you know, just Doppler effects or just sort of like he does, you know, just doing spacing where he'll have like, he'll have the, like a, a pickup, you know, somewhere halfway through the crowd, but then he'll have the timing figured out and he has wow. intervals and things figured out. So going from like a guy just setting up walls of, you know, amps in a rider truck following Greg Ginn and Henry Rollins around down to the now like so producing cool. like Coachella like live sound he does these huge things but it's really amazing but it's but I think I think about it so much with the amps too on stage it's like mm. I always felt like that thing of like or at least I've I've I should I should preface this. I like loud amps, and I've been told many times to turn down on stage. <laughs> and the idea of being <laughs> you're like you're this whole PA here, right? And I, my response is always like. I brought this thing in a van for eight hours across country, you know, here. And how in the world is my thing louder than the thing you have drilled into your ceiling? Right. Like, you know, there's something wrong here. Like, I should not be able to carry something that's, it's, you know, for the size of the room or whatever it is. It's like, maybe your thing is broken. Yeah, well, let's, maybe let's reverse, you. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, let's reverse <laughs> the, you know. Maybe your PA just sucks. Yeah. Let's, let's start with that. I mean, you, just, you should step up to where I'm at. But um, <laughs> but it's 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 hard. I mean, I don't know what's, what's the answer for that, you know what I mean? Just, I know. Um, just, I, I, yeah, I don't know. What do you, yeah, what do you, what do you do with that sort of world of like just volume? Like, is there with like, volume? I mean, I like loud amps, and yeah. I'm actually quite lucky. When I'm testing an amp, nobody tells me to turn down. <laughs> <laughs> well, some amps just sound. I guess that's a better question. I should, yes. I should get technical on the technical side of this. Like, what about volume? That's a that's a terrible well, yeah, question. Well, but but what is some amps sound better loud? Why? Why a is lot that? of people like. like you know, if it's a high powered amp, like hundred watt amp or something, it's it's you're gonna get the breakup when it's at like eight, nine, or ten on the volume dial. Like it's gonna be it's the pure like overdrive sound that a lot of people love. Yeah. And you can't get that breakup in your tone on like two or three on the volume dial. It's just not there. It's even with the ma- and it, I mean, there, there's a, there's a form of compression that starts to mm-hmm. kick in. There's the, it exactly. starts to sag, and and that's sort of in when you're really engaging that power amp section of those power amp tubes. Yes. When those are really feeling the like the 
when those are being pushed, mm-hmm. then with the big the big old Transformers stuff starts to kick in, really starts to soak those up, right? That's, totally. Uh, being a fan, I mean, the only reason I've looked at this, you know, is being a fan of uh, uh, the Sun Model T amps, <laughs> it's like... You know, I've used the power soakers. I've put in the air brakes. I've put in all the attenuators between the sedan. And it's like there's something's not right here because like you're getting all like the fuzz on the front, but it's you're not really doing the like you the know, full thing. Yeah, the the, the the molecular. I always felt because it was always like when you felt your in the back of your knees. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you feel your pants vibrating, yes. <laughs> that's the like. Oh, it's that's part the of thing. it's the part it's, of the right? experience, like yeah. feeling that power and that volume, and like playing your guitar and like you're it's you feel it when you play your guitar and it's like the amp is transcribing what you're feeling it's yeah. it's like a whole circle effect so when you're not able to turn up as loud as you might want to it's just like me like a little yeah boo but a lot of people <laughs> like to use attenuators which are cool and everything but it's not the same there's something yeah really pushing like power amps yes. that does something totally different yeah 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 all right. Well, I think we got to come up with like some kind of like live venue. I think LA probably could sustain this. Like the, I remember there was a there was a place in Manchester that uh, was uh, was called like the Deaf Institute, and I was like, oh, maybe that was. I think I was just honoring the like the history of the building. I was like, but no, I want a real like yeah. <laughs> hearing, hearing impairment like a uh, well, social club or something where we can really can play, play loud and loud and can, the like... vibration can be felt. <laughs> yes. Like it's like a vibe. You know, totally. it's like you feel the sound. I always felt like yeah. I mean, but you know, one of the louder shows no surprise was you know my bloody valentine and the mm. reunion shows and i you know i stood there and it was really it was like a molecular like feeling you felt it like the sound in your body and it does totally. the vibrations it does there's something on the on the physics sort of side of things like oh yeah i was like rearranged you it's know? spiritual like it's, there's something else right in the band like sun oh mm-hmm. you know where you're like i feel like they obviously go for that kind of, there's a there's a very kind of like religious and biblical sort of like totally. iconography they use for that but i get it you know, like, I have a client uh, and a friend who he has like three Fender Super Six reverbs, oh and he lives on a farm, <laughs> and he will just bl- carry those amps into the middle of the property, and just blast, blast <laughs> off, and that's like that's that's a great experience that's, right there. That's something, yeah, right. That's yeah. There's a there's like sheep no, and but... stuff like just around. <laughs> Like that's pretty awesome. <laughs> that's so cool. There was a great story, and I don't know if, how apocryphal it is, but it was like Neil Young, like on his property, like row out, you know, had one barn on one side, one barn on the other side, and had like two different like bands playing or something. But he would just like row out to the middle of the lake and was row by himself. And I don't know if he was testing the band, if he was testing the equipment or something. But there was like Whoa. two barns, and, like he was a being stuff. It's like I wanted to hear it from like you know a hundred feet away or two hundred feet away. Like that's so cool. Yeah. yeah, I feel like just a big space like that <laughs> with the ability to play as loud as you want that's but that's what's, what's so up. fun that's why people are going to these big outdoor festivals mm-hmm. it's the same sort of idea you know what i mean right. it's like but yeah just be, being five feet away from it certain you know on the stage is the problem yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> um that is that's so awesome so what what are what are your favorite amps it just has you know from a point of view sorry this is a, such an amp heavy thing so no, if, if, any, if anybody it. tuned in here and was like wait wait what's an amp like we're, <laughs> this is not the show for you come back next week yes. we'll figure this out. <laughs> um, but yeah what are you what are your sort of like you know mount rushmore of amps uh so i love certain things about certain amps like okay yeah. my roots lie with fender because I, I started off building you know tweed fender clones and all that stuff but the serviceability of Fender amps is unparalleled. Like you can open one of those up and they are so serviceable. They sound great. Um, they don't do high gain very well, but they do cleans quite well. Um, in terms of high gain amps, I love like JCM 800s, JMPs, of course, like any Marshall amp from like the 70s or 80s. I, I want one. I don't have one, but I want one. Let, let me just, sorry, there's another tangent. Sorry, don't mind jumping in. The Marshalls are so, have always been so confusing to me. Like, again, kind of like being broke, you know? And it's like, there's so many of them and so many. Mm-hmm. And again, like, I'm probably going to sound like a big dummy here, but I'll call myself out for it. Like, so they all sort of look the same as right. well. And they all have like, like s- subtle differences. And there's yeah. like the Master Mark II or whatever. Like, oh my it's God. Like... But especially being a band, and for any new bands, I don't know who, who, I don't know if anybody's listening to this, but but especially new bands where you get like a backline. Mm-hmm. Like I've seen a million, you know, um, 800s and 
I don't know if one is like the other. And I've like I've I've looked at them for for you know yeah for years, and I'm just like I don't know what this is. Like there was one once that sounded good. The rest of them, there's a lot of like just kazoo. I always kind of call it like a kazoo sort mm-hmm. of fuzz, where it's like there's a, some kind of like a little thin. Well, yeah, they're thin, but it's just like a, it feels like a tone over the tone of the guitar. Mm, like you're playing, yes. you play the guitar into its tone. Like it already just has like a yes. You know, I totally know you're what you mean. Kind of just buzzing through like a thing of like it's not the sound of the guitar that's breaking up. It's the amp itself is already ready to be broken up, and it's... you're just putting something underneath it, and kind of like you're trying to. You can't pierce that veil of like just. You're like pushing the distortion. air through. <laughs> yeah, there's something about that. I don't know. So again, yeah, with eight, I'm just curious. You know, to really, to really like so nerd out on the amp some world, like... some Marshalls have like two channels mm-hmm. uh, or two or two like sets of inputs. Yeah. Um, and I know there's. Some of some models of Marshall have that like I can't remember like my space. Or you like engage like a boost or something, or there's like the yeah yeah there's like a high and a low or something like that. And the high like the high input always has that like harsh distortion, but then there's the other input or the other channel that has a little bit creamier, darker breakup. Yeah, that's what I like. That's the fun part. Yeah. Um. But it's funny. It must just be something they're looking for. I think it's also like you say, high gain versus non high gain. I think that's one thing I've had to learn just over the years of like, there's you know I think like metal in you know, the mm-hmm. kind of the, the you know modern metal or like you know through kind of like eighties metal like sort of this idea of the high gain, the Soldanos or yes. these things of the world. Like it's almost just a different beast altogether, totally. right? Like a high gain amp versus just an amp. Totally, it's totally because there's extra gain stages and there's ex- you know because you have the tone and the character of the amp have to be totally different if you are going for like that high gain crunch versus like a clean tone yep like the whole tonal characteristics are different because again like we were talking about with the marshall there are high gain tones that aren't don't sound great you know like they could be just harsh or whatever you want like a thick full distortion well, harmonic tone. distortion yeah. so there's this idea of right of just like are you really like hearing what the the notes are doing on the, on the amp versus just hearing the amp by itself the amp totally. sort of playing itself and out there. yeah, yeah. But okay it, sorry i interrupted okay oh, sorry. No, it's all good. <laughs> but it's cool like i'm in a great position because i get to test all of these amps that come across my bench and sometimes it's an amp i've never heard um, so I kind of have developed like, oh, I love these like old Gibsons, like 40s and 50s Gibson amps are amazing. And they're v- most of the time it's just a volume and a tone control, but they sound good. And when you crank them, the breakup is just so creamy. And I mean, that was like either before or around the time when distortion actually became sought after because previously, you know, guitar amps were used for like lap steel or clean guitar like jazz hawaiian music or whatever and then it evolved to being like high gain being sought after but yes those distortion amps... was almost the mistake exactly like if people didn't want that if your amp was got a lot of distortion in it it was yeah, yeah it wasn't seen as favorable it probably i think yeah. it actually was a mistake <laughs> like in the studio it's like yeah i there's like a Marty Robbins song. I don't know if this is true. You know, there's always like so many stories of where did something originate. But there's, uh, I think it's like Don't Worry or something by Marty Robbins. And halfway through the song, the guitar all of a sudden st- sounds super distorted. And I think that might have been a mistake. Like something blew out in the amp. But they were like, no, that sounds cool. <laughs> so Amazing. Tone is something that's like very subjective and everybody has their personal preferences. And I was always seeking out like... It's a journey. It's always evolving, like the the type of music that you're playing or whatever. No, if you're playing a certain guitar, that'll sound different with the different amps. Totally. And so it's all, it's yeah. a fun thing. And it's your ears too. I think I've you know as now getting to count myself with with older people in the world. It's like I realize like oh yeah, years and years and years, especially like blowing your ears out, blowing your ears out. Like you do start to develop like a taste yeah. for that yes. sort of thing. It's like, <laughs> like I want my amp to sound totally blown out. Yeah. Or what that exact, what that version of blown out that you like is. There's mm-hmm. a lot of versions of that. Like, Oh, that's just that your speaker is just blown. That's not good. Right. I can never understand this like cut speaker thing. Like, cause that, oh. that just sounds like the worst idea in the world. I've had, broken speakers they don't sound good they don't i don't know why anybody would ever think to you know like people say like i just there was i saw um who, who's putting it out someone has a has a pedal and it's called like the shredded speakers and i'm like 
okay, I know what this is going to sound like, but right. it's not. But if you actually were to do that, it doesn't actually sound that way. Like, have yeah. you come across anything like on that world of stuff? Or uh, is there ever a speaker that does sound better with cuts in it? I don't think so, in <laughs> yeah. my personal opinion. Like, I can understand why somebody would want to do that. It's like, for some reason, the image of like putting a playing card in your bicycle spokes. <laughs> That's yeah. like what it sounds like. <laughs> like, it just sounds like flappy and thin. If yeah. you do that, like, n- I don't, I have never come across anybody who is like, this is what I'm going for. Yeah. We're demystifying it here. Do not cut your speaker. Cones. Don't cut your speakers. But if you wanted to try it, I mean, maybe try it on a speaker that's already a little bit like the cone is already kind of shot. Yeah. Cause yeah. then you have nothing to lose there. <laughs> But, yeah, I feel like the kinks, like you know, kind of are yeah. like inscribed with that, and it's like I've heard the records. That's not a that's not a cut speaker. That's like one of the worst like things. But I could, but again, it probably makes good copy, and it's a fun mm-hmm. thing. Like, wow, they're so punk, right? Cut right, it's definitely it's punk like, rock oh, for sure. But it doesn't, yeah, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah, like many things, punk rock. <laughs> um, very cool. Uh, I, what about PVs? I was oh, on your list of things. Love yeah. PVs. Okay. Yeah, I saw I saw your PV tattoo. That's why I was, I was, was, was wondering. Yeah, where does PVs fit in the mix of like the pantheon of, of amps? So, PV for me is just very like Southern rock, okay. raunchy. I've like I have a special affinity for like Skinner and Molly Hatchet oh, and yeah. bands like that. Um, in part because like my dad loves that music and my partner's from the South, and so like Southern rock is just a very like awesome thing in my life but um the tone of pv is just like i don't know the the way that they sound turned up really loud and the gain on those just it just what does era something. pv though i guess that's the other thing oh. right this is the kind of pv is a lot of things to a lot of there's people a lot, right, right. like many like most modern companies they've gone through their stages but right and I, yeah, yeah now i mean pv does like a lot of i think through my research, I've found that PV over the years they just like to be modern and relevant, and they like to be cutting edge with their stuff. Like they yeah. have a lot of studio equipment, live music equipment, and that's all kind of state of the art, modern technology. But my favorite PV era is like seventies and eighties. Oh yeah, I I even I'll take in like the eighties solid state amps because. There, it's very, you know... It's workable. Workable, solid state. A lot of it's yeah. just service issues. But, yeah, like the Roadmaster, which I just put a video uh, out um, with. Like, that's a total tube amp. Mm-hmm. Six output tubes. It's huge. Like, <laughs> six preamp tubes. It's huge. Two channels. Um, but, yeah, that one was really fun to play. PVs are really one of those things too. I think for a lot of years, I think you know that you they they would just find them everywhere. They were mm. affordable. Like it's it's always that thing of like you know what's one person's trash is another person's treasure kind of thing. And they and I think they just had such a bad stink on them from all the '80s stuff. But then but again, it's what's sometimes finding the needle in a haystack. Like finding those like maybe two to three really sweet ones or, or an era of PV, yeah. you know, because one thing is, and I think that's the funny thing with Marshall is because they've sort of kept a similar look or something, they haven't really, it's, they hide a lot of like true. new stuff in the same shell. Very true. Where they don't really, because they're trying to keep this thing and you're like, but no, 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 you just make it snake skin, make it purple. Like yeah. that, that way I know where we're at. Like I want to know what, what is inside of that shell of a head because you can't, you can't put all that stuff in there and then tell me it's a vintage thing, exactly. whatever the name is. It's like, I don't, I'm not buying it. <laughs> um, if you are ever at a garage sale and you see a PV amp that has like the blue, white, gray, like knobs, like they're all oh, the different yeah. colored knobs. Yeah. Uh, th- that's how you know it's good. Those are good. Oh, what is this? No, what it's just are like those are, those are the, that's this like late seventies, early eighties oh, okay, era. Gotcha. Like they just have like, I think like each knob, like for preamp gain is like white or okay, blue yes. is like post gain or whatever. But, um, that's the sweet spot. Those are, know. yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. But if anybody finds any of those out there, write in. Yes, please. Hi- hyphenate halftime at gmail dot com. Let <laughs> us know. We will go pick them up for you. I um I went down a, a, a black flag rabbit hole for a lot of years, and I have this um this behind you, this PV uh, PA, which was a uh, four channel PA. Yeah, those are great. They're totally awesome. There's, you know, there's, they're kind of featured in the back of pictures. If you know, if you if you do enough forensic evidence on on early bands playing live shows, and you can go. Yeah. Yeah, you well, see so those found, a lot. Yeah, and so that was a super cool one. So I found I mean that's not the original. That's just that's just, you know. But I do yeah, anyway. That's it's not the original, but I found this this one and it sounds great. And again, it's just you you crank it up and it kind of sounds like 
a big mess, a big yeah. muddy mess of guitar. And you're like, <laughs> that's kind of those early Black Flag, you yeah. know, like records and things, and it's fun. But again, it was a hundred bucks. Oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Great. So there's just that kind of fun stuff and when you see so something durable. like, like right? they're so durable. Like it'll last forever. Yeah, yeah, I love for that. For a long time. Yeah. yeah, and then there was another kind of like Josh Homme sort of like PV thing that he used, and I've seen clones of it. There's something, some kind of small practice oh, that he used. There was another yeah. PV sort I don't, of like cults. Going it's that funny. Way. There's so many different like models of PV amp from that era. There's like the Bandit, the right, Deuce, yes. and then some that I'm like I've never heard of this one. <laughs> It was probably along those lines. Yeah, right, yeah, like the small kind of practice mm-hmm. sort of things, yeah. What a prolific company. You know what yeah. I mean? Just, you know, that's a fun thing, too, when you really, like, you go down this stuff. Like, what do you often see the most? Like, what is the, what's your common... Definitely sort of old like, Fender amps is kind of the bread and butter because Fender amps were made in Fullerton, California. So mm-hmm. being in Southern California, there's a high concentration of them here. Oh, that's interesting. And actually, I mean... I'm like, how can I still see fenders that are all original? And I still do. They still come through, which is awesome. But like back in Chicago, you know, you'd see an old vintage fender here and there. But I mean, probably half my inventory right now is old fender. Wow. Um, well, it's interesting. There's still kind of ge- geographic sort of regional, mm-hmm. regional sort of ideas of like where these amps sort of are located. Yeah. And, where you and it's like them. if you go to the south, like you'll probably see a ton of PV amps. That's probably where, like, that's um, concentrated. Uh, And it's just, like, trainer amps remain in Canada. We don't see a ton of them here. They do trickle down, but you probably see way more of those up north. Specialized sort of thing. Yeah, just like you see Marshalls and Oranges, So you know, in the UK. Right. You see those. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah, Orange is a whole other other thing that's kind of, like, come across. I played this great OR120 once on a back line. Never seen one. That, you know, it's been those. It was not quite a holy grail, but I, knew, you know, I think I put in like Model T, like you know, so sort I of yes. put in like requests on the back line, and then so the, so one it was at this All Tomorrow's Parties Festival thing, and it was just like, wait a second, this is amazing. Like, what is this? Like, I I, I, so I want to take this home sick. with me. This is amazing. Like, that was something that was so. And they, but again, then you see a million other oranges, and I and you go through them on. I've had oranges, every different orange on. You know, like no. Nope. Nope, nope. That was the one. That was the, the, that was the one. The R120 is kind of creme de la creme. Yeah. I have one I in like, the shop right now. No way. That's amazing. I do. I it's get fun. like maybe I would say two or three, maybe two, yeah, two to three vintage orange amps a year. Oh, that's cool. But this is my that's second OR120 of the year. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, if they ever, if they're ever looking to, 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 to sell, sell. Right? I'm sure it's no, not, it's not hard to mind. do, but those are one of those ones I was like trying to find. Like, I mean, there's hints, you'll, you'll catch whiffs somewhere. Like right. someone saw one, someone knows a guy, but again, but they're all, but they get all these great amps. They're in good, good homes as mm-hmm. they should be, you know, they're going to find their place out there. Yeah. The, a lot of people, yeah. like we talked about earlier in the conversation, yeah. like a lot of people will pay, like it's, they're looking for a specific amp and those are the people who if you are trying to sell an app, like those are the people who you will sell to are the yeah. people who are like, I'm willing to like, I want this amp. Like that's cause the it's, one. Yeah. Cause when you play it, you know, and it's just sort of, you're connected to that sort of yes, thing, right? Totally. Do you see more people with combos versus, you know, heads and cabs? Is I that would say, yeah, a lot of combos, especially, um, in recording studios mm-hmm. and, um, yeah, I would say it's probably split, but um, yeah, it's definitely split. Because like a lot of gigging musicians like heads because they can just use the back line, whatever, like cab is back lined or oh, whatever. That's cool. But yeah, I would say it's it's mixed for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. And then um, what's what's next? Like, where do you sort of go from, you know, in this in this world of amp repair does it do you, does it grow does it go further what are your what are some of your thoughts in terms of now this where you're at here at this size and what sure. what happens yeah yeah so i mean when i first started building or uh repairing amps and getting into amps i really wanted to build amps that was because i was inspired by my uncles and i just kind of fell into the repair thing but i i eventually would like to build some amps and i've been working on prototypes but it's definitely on the back burner. Um, eventually, I would like to maybe limit my repair intake so I can balance that out a little bit. But 
I say that and then I don't limit it because it's hard to say no. It's hard to know oh, what. No. Like I'm not going to say no to a deluxe reverb, and I'm not going to say no to like a super rare old amp. I mean, in this economy too, of just as a gig economy sort of thing, you never know when things get yes. slow or you know. So I think for a while I want to just continue doing the repair thing and making videos. Um, I've been doing a new segment on my channel where I'm doing like interviews with people um, who are in the music industry, um, who are maybe techs or people in music stores or studios or whatever. So that's been really cool to like archive those conversations. So I guess right now we'll see what happens. Oh, but the two like cool. tube amps are so the resurgence has just been so cool to see a lot of like younger people are getting into them as well, which is really exciting. So I think like the tube amp thing is just going to keep going. That's for amazing. Sure. And then are people making new tubes? This was a big conversation. I feel like, you know, I'm old. So it was the thing of like, oh, these got to get these from Russia. Oh, you got to get these from, we found new old stock. There was always some guy somewhere smoking a cigarette who could tell you some story about where a tube came from. But what's the latest updates on tubes? I'm very passionate yep. about this subject yes. because I good quality tubes are very very difficult to hone in on because i mean back in the the day the radio era the tv era tubes were manufactured in the us and those tubes are so dang durable that a lot of the times i'll have amps come in that still have old rca tubes in them and they're still good Amazing. um and then i get modern tubes where I install them and they fail within a week. It's really disappointing. But so, you know, I've kind of um, experimented with different manufacturers. And a lot of them are manufactured by the same factory, just different names. So it's a lot of trial and error, just finding the tubes that are mo most durable and most sound the best and have the least amount of issues. But I wish that tubes would be made with the same like quality control and the same like standards that they used to be because it's one of those things where it was there wasn't a failed obsolescence you know what i mean it's a tube is can almost be equated to like light bulbs yes and sort of light bulbs are sort of had an expected light if they lasted too long you weren't going to make your money so they needed to make them worse mm -hmm. you know sort of the early tech story of that but yeah with with you know audio tubes it's like you can't you can't have that yeah so we'll see what happens mm. with that i mean i I've talked to people a lot about this because I do. I know somebody who has bought, and it's just sitting in a warehouse, I think, in like Pasadena. But all this tube manufacturing equipment, Ooh. and well, that'd be exciting. I know. I think yeah. that you know. I don't know what like the the standards of like health. <laughs> right. yeah, <laughs> you know, right. it's it ain't yeah. like it used yeah. to be. Yeah. That's for sure. The standards get, are way higher now. If you get some some OSHA clearance to figure out how to, can you even make? Right. Well, that's the big question, right? Yeah. Are they going to be? They, you know, for some reason, Russia was always the thing. Like yeah. a lot of old audio equipment. Or same with like record pressing plants. Mm -hmm. You know, like there was a whole like just kind of industry of just like repurposing old Soviet, um, you know, m machinery. Yeah, but, yeah, I definitely think the Russian made tubes now are like the best yeah. I, they do have a failure rate of course but um they are i've found to be the most uh reliable but yeah it would be it would be a dream come true to see that happen i don't know if it will but it would be a dream come true super cool um cool but uh, yeah before we wrap up we're getting we're getting close to the end um I want to talk about pool, but also I just want to touch on the fact of just being a woman in music and in tech and stuff like, or, you know, teching for, for sides. Like, mm -hmm. how is that, how, what is that experience like, or how do you kind of come to that? And what is your sort of thoughts, you know, like in, in the space and what is it like now? Obviously, totally. you know. I'm, um, I was so, so lucky at the beginning to have my mentor, Mike Del Valley. He like gave me so much confidence and there were, there were times when like I was first starting out and he was teaching me and people would come pick up their amps and he'd be like, she fixed this. And they'd be like, ha ha, no, she did. You know, and oh, it, God, he would yeah, always yeah. stick up for sure. me. He gave me so much confidence. And like I've, all, I've had like those feelings of like, I don't know as much about this as this person might, you know, the imposter syndrome type stuff. But, but we all do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. All day um, long. So I don't know. I guess. Long story short, I've been lucky to have like lead mentors and peers and coworkers who have done nothing but like support me and I've I've 
the experiences have been rare where it's been like negative. Um, I think it's really cool because I've had a lot of like young women reach out to me who are like interested in learning more about amp stuff and seeing that like this is something that you can do and it's like it's a avenue that's less traveled but like if you're in music and you're interested in pursuing this it's cool to see people like doing it um a lot of the guys in the repair world are like have been doing it for a really long time they're like in their 60s 70s 80s even some of them and um it's it's cool it's been cool to like the bef- you know form relationships with them and they're like this is awesome that you're keeping this going cuz we thought that it would just die when we died um so it's it's been cool and motivating to carry that torch and to you know just make it more known that this is something that you can pursue it's kind of normalized across mm-hmm. all gender lines or whatever totally. you know, i mean just just as another sp- space of work mm-hmm. i did find um on the last we we toured the u.s last fall and some european stuff too but it was like i felt like post pandemic there were a lot more like female you know fronting like yes. people in the live music experience you know where there totally. was, it was you know front of house it was teching it was kind of an all you know aspect and it's always been you know that kind of way and i guess it was one of those things i didn't want to like call out too much my mind but i was also like fuck yeah this yeah. is awesome like, oh, you know, especially totally younger, to be younger women like you know what I mean like cause it was always and I, that was that was such a bummer of a thing of it a lot of you know live music was always this like kind of boys club thing yes. where just guy, you know, was, you know in all black clothes and just everyone the, the jokes were bad and right. this whole <laughs> kind of camaraderie or the fraternity-ness of it it was a little like you know as a you know whatever it's you know, hard. sort of progressive sort of punk band or just you know <laughs> not, not not boneheads you know you're yeah. out there like oh there's so many boneheads this sucks like this is not my like don't don't let me in with these guys i'm not trying to do this here you it know can, but it just you feel that you just always felt that but it was yeah. hopefully if, the, if that culture evolves and progresses and changes you know it's so. cool and it's cool i totally agree i've seen yeah. like so many more like such a diverse group of people taking on roles in all aspects of the music industry and it I'm it's it can be intimidating, you know, at first, but I think as it's becoming more and more like recognized and celebrated that, you know, more people from all different backgrounds will feel motivated and inspired to pursue these things yeah it can only be good yeah more more women totally in roles of yes. life and, and <laughs> you know industry and business and tech and and just everything and repairs of all of it it just makes sense it's um, obvious i don't know if you knew yeah. this but one of my favorite facts about fender is like back in the 40s and 50s women were building the amps oh incredible there's a lot and like even back in radio times a lot of women were working the factories like soldering and wiring stuff and um in like tweed fender amps a lot of the time you'll open it up and there's a little piece of tape on the bottom and the whoever built the amp would sign her name there's like lily and lupe are like the two like notable um ones but that's incredible so it's that's also inspiring like just back in the manufacturing days you know, until yeah. now, it's just kind of we've passed the torch along. <laughs> yeah, but I think it needs to be more of a spotlight put on it, though, too, just more yeah. celebration, just kind of more like awareness of that. Totally, that's amazing. And then, okay, so tell me about pool. Oh, is your, the side hustle. <laughs> what, in side between hustle. Repa- in, re- in between repairing amps, you you can make it, make some easy coin. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but um, yeah, I love playing pool. It's like one of those. It's my biggest hobby outside of music. Um, I'm on a pool league, and it's like such a great stress relief and just another thing to learn more about. And I've met some great people through it. It's very fun. That's awesome. Do you have your own queue? Yeah. Awesome. Where where is good to play pool in LA? I'm out of the. In this area, actually, there's a lot. Um, We play at the American Legion Hall in Sun Valley. Okay. there's two pool tables there and everybody there is so cool and like down to play. They're all like pretty good players and are willing to give you pointers and teach you and everything. And um, so a lot like being on pool league, I've found all of the little niche. It's a lot of like veterans halls because they have pool tables. That's awesome. There's not really a lot of bars around here with pool tables, maybe in North Hollywood. Okay. Ish. 
but um, I feel like yeah, that kind of the social sort of communities change. Those yeah. Things, yeah. yeah. But I've met a lot of great like, people through pool, and so it's just like a fun little stress reliever. Not dealing with music at all, but <laughs> just it's good for my brain because I need to. I like being like my brain. If I'm not doing something my brain doesn't like that so yes. it's it's, so it's nice like keeping to... busy but not yeah not yeah driving yourself crazy exactly that's amazing um yeah i've 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 never been good at pool it's always been very you know so just hit the ball and you go it's gonna go there it doesn't go there <laughs> it's gonna go there. it's gonna happen. Right? it didn't happen and i've you know for all the all my time in bars like this is this is not my angle it's fun like it's one of those things that it, it's a lifelong sport. I mean, a lot of these guys in the veterans halls, some of them are blind oh my God. or have, plays with one arm. <laughs> it's just cool that, to see like these people just who are, they, there's really not a lot of other sports that they could really play right now at this point, but yeah. pool is like one of those things that challenges them and it's like a social thing. So that's awesome. It's fun. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for being for thank being on the for show. Me. Um, if people want to know more about you and find out more, can you? What, what are your socials? What are the links you want people yeah. to find you? So my Instagram is Fazio Electric. I post a lot on there about like the amps that I'm fixing, things I'm working on, um, and then my YouTube channel is also under Fazio Electric. And then my website is FazioElectric.com. And yeah, that, I think that's it. Super cool. Yeah, and those will all be in the show notes, too. So anybody's cool. looking for them, yeah, they can click on through. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was great, it was great to meet you. Thank you. Dude, Colleen fucking rules. She's so awesome. So, uh, yeah, I just feel lucky knowing cool people like her. I always, you know, when anybody that plays guitar or plays old guitars or old amps, you just knows, you know, always need a, a good tech, somebody that knows what they're doing and isn't afraid to open stuff up and get in there and find, you know, new old stock or just know what, what will put the thing back on the road and working. So, uh, a good tech is, is worth so much and worth knowing. So I, I, I count myself among the lucky ones to say that I know Colleen Fazio. Um, and now you do as well. You know her better than you did before. So please go follow her uh, YouTube channel. That's uh, Fazio Electric, as well as uh, hit up her website, um, FazioElectric.com. You can also follow her on Instagram, at Fazio Electric, for all things vintage amp repair. Thank you again, Fazio. <laughs> Thank you again, Colleen, uh, for, for coming over. It was really, really awesome. Great, great to meet you. And uh, I will see you guys on Monday with Farley to talk all things Fazio. So it'll be a Randall Fazio Farley conversation. Be there. Have a good weekend. <laughs>